Hey y'all, it's Ashley Bookie Sharp and I'm back with another video. So today, as you can see from the title of this video, I'm here to do my mid-month wrap-up. I did do mid-month wrap-ups starting in 2021, and I think I was doing them in 2020 as well. And then I stopped and I was just doing a wrap-up at the end of the month, but those wrap-ups were like an hour and a half long. And honestly, I know a lot of y'all love the long wrap-ups but they are such a pain to edit. And I think by splitting my wrap-ups into two again, it'll give me a little bit more time to talk about the books that I've read that month. I made the decision to start doing the mid-month wrap-ups again because I have read 30 books already in the month of January. And I was definitely in a headspace like, there's no way I'm gonna be able to talk about all of these books by the end of the month. And we are only about two weeks and some change into January. And I don't know how much more I'm going to read and honestly the reason why I've been reading so much lately is because it has become a slight coping mechanism which is not a hundred percent great it has helped me kind of work through and in some ways avoid some things that I am currently going through so that's why I said it's a good thing and a bad thing and then also I have been reading a lot of my comics and graphic novels which don't really take me that long to read so that's why I am sitting now at 30 books but I definitely thought like 30 books in there's no way that I am going to be able to wrap all of this stuff up at the end of the month and we're talking 30 books in the middle of the month so let's go ahead and jump in because this is probably gonna end up being a long video anyway because I have a lot of material to cover. So the first thing that I ended up reading was a manga and it is The Summer of You volume number one and this is one where I'm not even sure where I got the recommendation from or where I heard of this manga. It could have been somebody at the library, it could have been somebody on booktube, I just can't remember. This is the story of two high school boys who end up becoming friends and they share this passion for films and filmmaking and they end up spending the summer together and of course they end up catching feelings for each other. One confesses his love for the other and the other spends time trying to process his feelings because the one that confesses his love basically says to him like I just need to let you know this it doesn't mean that you have to care about me back or love me back or like me back in the same way. So the second guy is trying to work through his feelings. I really did enjoy this. I thought it was really really cute. There were some parts of the story that were a little too convenient but nevertheless it did flow nicely. I love the artwork. I think I had a little hiccup with some of the text bubbles where there were points where I couldn't associate like what text was supposed to go to what character and so it made sometimes the conversation a little bit difficult to figure out unless it was in within context of what had been talked about before but this is one that I definitely want to continue and one that I enjoyed and I do want to end up reading a little bit more beyond manga throughout the year and I ended up giving this one four out of five stars. I ended up reading another manga after that and that's way the house husband volume number four this is just a collection of almost like short funny stories about tatsu who is the main character i thought that after reading volume three we were going to get a little bit more cohesiveness and a little bit more plot but it appears that there's never going to be kind of like a central storyline they're told in vignettes and it really is about him being this former mob boss and kind of still having those lingering attitudes or mentality as he just does his day-to-day -day things and he's a house husband. This one I did really enjoy though because there were moments when I was really really laughing out loud and it was funny when he brought mob members into his foolishness and the artwork is always great. These are usually really really quick to read because they're not so text heavy. I do see myself possibly getting tired of the series if we don't ever get a central storyline so I do have volumes five and six checked out from the library currently and hopefully fingers crossed we do get something more concrete in the future or I may end up deciding to kind of shelf the series but I did give this volume four out of five stars. The next one that I ended up reading was a short novella by Rosie Adams and it is just for tonight. I saw quite a few people were reading this on Goodreads that I'm friends with and I thought well while we're still in the new year this is one that I could really really 
pick up and, and just enjoy. And it focuses on two characters by the name of Giselle and Roman. And they have been kind of friends or associates because they're both friends of a couple that's getting married on this resort on New Year's Day. So they really haven't gotten the opportunity to get to know each other as much as they want to because Roman is a photographer and he moves around a lot. So he's never in one place for too long. But of course, when they meet on New Year's Eve, right before the wedding, there is undeniable chemistry and they decide to take things to the next level. I definitely would have loved to begin my new year the way that Giselle did. Roman had such a filthy mouth and it had me weak at the knees. I thought it was great. It's a happy for now. So there is no definite conclusion to where the romance is going to go. But I did see that Rosie Adams is coming out with a follow up to this in August of this year. So I'm looking forward to reading it. And I gave this one four out of five stars. The next one that I ended up reading was You Got Anything Stronger. And this is by Gabrielle Union. This is the follow up to the novel that she did or the memoir that she did before we're going to need more wine in 2017. This one literally picks up right where the other one left off. And she gives us a, another compilation of essays that talk about her experiences since the time that she published that last book. It covers a host of different topics like racism, what it's like to go through surrogacy, what it's like to have been or still be a parent to Dwayne's other children and having a child that is is trans and how that has impacted her and Dwayne and that child and how it's played itself out in the black community. One of the essays that I appreciated the most was a story about how Gabrielle Union and Dwayne were handling the fact that Zaya identifies as a trans woman and how much learning they had to do as a couple to better support Zaya and what it's been like having a black trans child because if you know anything the intersection or the cross-section between being black and queer and dealing with the black community can often be quite difficult and I appreciated that, that Gabrielle Union identified that her and Dwayne constantly have a lot of learning to do and they're not afraid for people to call them out and tell them like hey this is wrong or you should be doing x y and z and that they've tried their best to create safe spaces but it just is nice to know that there is a public black couple like these public figures who are very adamant about support Supporting their child that does identify as trans. The other essay that I really really liked was Gabrielle Union's exploration of the movie Bring It On. I think that Gabrielle Union has often been defined as playing the mean girl in a lot of the movies that she's been in which she has played the mean girl and I think that people have often associated that with her in real life personality which I know that I have and it's kind of hard to break that wall between what's reality and what the roles are that she has to play in these movies but she talks about bringing on in a different lens and you know bringing on is definitely a cult classic people love it but she dives deep into what the writers and producers did with bring it on and how they pin the black cheerleaders and the white cheerleaders against each other if you didn't know the black che cheerleaders in the movies are not even given last names they're forced to react in certain ways to their cheers being stolen even the way that they're named as characters is very indicative of how people were viewing those black characters and I think that now knowing what she knows being a black actress in Hollywood in this day and age I wonder if she would have done things differently when it came to bring it on but I think that it definitely made me look at that movie in a completely different lens and now I do want to go back and rewatch it and see some of the things that she had pointed out in this essay. Overall I think this was another great memoir from Union. I think she writes with such humor and sincerity that people are definitely going to connect with her and I can't wait to see what she's going to be doing in the future and I ended up giving this one four out of five stars. The next book that I ended up reading was Unbound My Story of Liberation and the Birth of the Me Too Movement and this is by Tarana Burke who is actually the creator of the Me Too Movement and I spend a lot of time thinking about the Me Too Movement and its correlation to Hollywood and I often find that a lot of people don't even realize that the Me Too Movement was created by a black woman to help black women black Black girls and black femmes share their experiences and empathy in times that they have been sexually assaulted and or raped and so it was nice being able to pick up this book and hear from the creator's own voice. I will say that this book is not for the faint of heart. It is not an easy read. It's clear that this was kind of therapeutic for Burke to write this book and there were a couple times in this book that I found myself quite triggered by what
what she was discussing in terms of her own experiences but I pressed on and I continued the novel because she makes a good point in saying that she's happy that the Me Too movement has gained such traction and that so many people have felt comfortable enough to come forward and tell their stories however there still is a lack of black women black girls and black femmes who are willing to share their stories because of the way that we are treated when we talk about sexual assault and rape and there is a gap in that treatment and it still stays there and I definitely resonated with that a lot. One of the most important things for me in memoirs is how the voice of the writer comes through and Tarana Burke definitely has a very unique voice and style in writing this and it's something that I think a lot of people are going to end up connecting to. I felt super safe with her even when there were points where I was like oh my gosh this is really making me feel kind of stressed a little bit because it's triggering the same things that I have personally been through but I felt like I was in a safe space with her and I felt empathy really seep through every page of this book there was no doubt in my mind that she was coming from a place of caring I also appreciated that she acknowledged her achievements as well as her faults there was a particular essay in this book that detailed her experiences with a young girl by the name of heaven and how she was unable to deal with her own experiences with sexual assault and rape there Therefore, she was unable to help this young girl kind of cope with her own experiences and she has a lot of regret about how she handled that situation. In addition, she had to acknowledge her own failings when it came to her child and I connected with that as a parent of a little black girl who I want to protect and save from the evils of this world and you know I don't want her to ever have to experience what I experienced when I was growing up. Honestly, I don't know if there's much that I could say about this book that's ever going to really do it justice. I think that is such a powerful book and I'm very 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 proud of and happy that Burke took the opportunity to sit down and write the story and I can't imagine how difficult it was to sit down and write about so many dark things in her life especially when we're talking about things like sexual assault and rape and detailing that in graphic in graphic words on page for the world to see it takes a lot of courage to do something like that but she does it to show how passionate she is about about the movement and how important this movement is to her for the safety of black women, black girls, and black femmes. And it's just a beautifully written book. I listened to this one on audio. I highly recommend listening to it on audio because she does read the book and I ended up giving it five out of five stars. The next two books I read are part of a KU series that I've had my eye on for a while. This year I am very focused on making sure I'm using my KU subscription to its fullest. So the books are in the 90s kind of love series which are kind of based on like 90s songs the first one is lay your head on my pillow by tans Tanzania Glover. I always want to mess up her her first name and these are really really short. They're not long. They're all kind of like a novella size. This first one focuses on two characters by the name Tony and Arlen. Tony is a counselor at a school. Arlen is at the school. He used to go to the school but he's there to work on a mural because he's an artist and the two get to talking and clearly Arlen has an attraction to Tony and they agree to have dinner for Tony's birthday and it's interesting figuring out where this attraction comes from because Tony's like why are you attracted to me it's a little bit of an age gap that's going on of course she looks at him and she thinks like he's young he's not gonna be able to handle this and of course that's not true I really did like the chemistry between the two the only hang up that I had is that it took me a while to get into Glover's writing I didn't feel like it flowed all the time and it was a little awkward in some spaces but overall it was a cute novella I ended up giving it three out of five stars the next one in the series is pretty brown eyes and this one is by Tia Love it focuses on two characters. I think her name is Messia. I'm not sure how to pronounce it but I believe it's Messia and Alex and Messia and Alex end up meeting because she's leaving a party. It's a family engagement for her parents and she's going home and she gets a nail on her tire and he comes to help change the tire and fix it because she doesn't have a spare and she is like not for him at all. She's like you basically own like you have a tow truck and you're out here and I'm not 
not really interested in you and he ends up surprising her in a lot of different ways. Some of my favorite things about this book definitely were the family dynamics where we're introduced to Messiah's like entire family, her sisters, which I thought was a really interesting thing to do for such a short story. I like that Alex was down to earth and he forced her to let her guard down in ways that she didn't really expect, which was good for her because she was love adverse because of a relationship that she'd had in the past. And they really take their time and get to know each other. I gave this one 3.5 stars. I would have rated it higher, but once again, the writing was just not on point for me. It was a little awkward at first. Once I got about a third of the way through the book, it started to flow really nicely. And then that's when I was able to fully enjoy the story. The next book that I ended up reading was A Stopover, which is the first book in the Miles High Club by T.L. Swan. I'd heard a lot about this book across Romance Booktube, and I saw that it was available on any play that I could listen to. And it's a fairly long book. It's over 500 pages. And I was like, I'm just, you know, going to listen to it while I get some work done and enjoy it. And it ended up being just an okay romance for me, solid romance, 3.5 stars, nothing really special about it necessarily. So the book itself follows two characters, Jameson and Emily, and they meet while they're on a flight and they end up having a one night stand. And I think that Emily thinks that things are going to go further and they end up not going further the way that she wants them to. And he ends up not contacting her for a year. So kind of fast forward, she ends up getting her dream job at this company and Jameson ends up being the CEO of the company. And when they come face to face again, he's basically like, I want to pick up where we left off. And she's like, no, we're not going to do this because I have a boyfriend and you decided that you weren't, go you weren't going to contact me for a year. So it's really interesting because Jameson is not the type of man to say no. He's very much so an alpha male. And it's interesting watching him trying to convince her to dump her boyfriend and basically start this whole thing with him. I think that the chemistry between them was really good, but I just didn't really care about them as characters. I think I enjoy Jameson a little bit more because he was a little bit more complex. He had this wall up, he had his guard up, he was an alpha male, but under all of that, he does end up being a sweet and caring man, but you just don't know that off of first glances. Emily and I did not vibe at all in a lot of, in a lot of different scenarios because Emily just was indecisive. And I don't know if I do very well with indecisive characters in romance books. It was a constant back and forth and push and pull between the two of them that was really frustrating and honestly quite repetitive in a lot of different ways. One of the things that I did enjoy about this book was the journalistic integrity of what we were seeing with Jameson's company and this is a section of the book where I think Emily's character really did shine because she helps them navigate and figure out some really really interesting things. The book itself is fast paced to be 500 pages. I was surprised at how fast I flew through the book. It didn't necessarily feel like it was a 500 page romance, which is a good thing considering the dynamics that the two characters did have. Overall, I thought it was a solid opening to the series. It's not really much that I can say in terms of like, yeah, this is something that I'm definitely going to continue. I haven't really made my decision on whether I'm going to continue the series or not. But like I said, solid read, 3.5 stars. The next one that I ended up reading was The Kindred by Alicia, by Alicia Dow. And this is one that I was really looking forward to and it was definitely a difficult one for me to rate and review because it didn't do as well as I thought it would do for me. I ended up giving this one 3.5 stars and I thought that I was going to enjoy it a lot more than what I did and I'll explain why. But The Kindred basically is a book that is not a sequel to The Sound of Stars but they do take place in the same universe and from what I understand because I haven't read The Sound of Stars is that when you read The Kindred, if you've read The Sound of Stars, you will see nods to that first book in this book. And it focuses on this whole entire universe where there are planets that have this program called The Kindred. And The Kindred is a program where you have a connection between two people. They don't even have to be on the same planet. Essentially, it allows them to communicate with each other from the time that they're born and they have this connection their entire life. They can see each other and it's supposed to create some sort of balance. So our two main characters, Joy and Felix, are kindreds. They're connected and they have been since birth. Joy comes from a more complicated situation. She lives more so in poverty and she is looked at differently because she's dark skin and she is plus size and Felix is a member of the nobility and things have always kind of been okay between them. They have a great relationship, but they can't go past just their standard kindred relationship, even though it seems like there's more feelings there. So 
things are kind of standard. I, it's of course it's a YA sci-fi and basically what ends up happening is the royal family gets assassinated and Joy and Felix are basically pinned as the people who did it even though they didn't so they flee their respective planets and they end up going to earth honestly i think i really enjoyed a lot of the sci-fi elements of this book before they crash landed i love learning about like the different planets and how they were dealing with classism and discrimination based off of like whatever planets the characters were coming from but then they get to earth and it's almost like it was a genre shift so it was sci-fi and then it started to feel like it was more of a contemporary temporary book and then you know when they get there it was very like Taylor Swift cottagecore and I'm sure that teen readers are really going to appreciate that but a lot of that stuff was lost on me as an adult so because of the constant shifts where it feels like it starts off as sci-fi then shifts to contemporary then goes back to sci-fi again the pacing was completely off like it felt like it went from fast to slow and fast to slow and it just made the book feel extremely disjointed I think one thing I did like was how Dow handled Joy as a character. She is a fat black girl and I feel like the representation there was done nicely. She does have moments where she's confident, there's moments where she's insecure, but it made her feel real as a character. I wasn't necessarily sold on Felix as a character because he has this elitist attitude and although that attitude really shifts when he's dealing with Joy, it wasn't enough for me to feel confident in his character change. I do think that it will be nice when readers do see the two of them connect because they've been kept away from each other for so long when they're on their respective planets and when they get to earth they have no choice but to work it out with each other and what happens between them is really really beautiful and I think that people will appreciate that. The best part of this book in my personal opinion is the queer representation. I believe and I'm hoping that I'm getting this right but this is how I read the coding. I believe that Joy is coded as being demisexual and that Felix is being coded as being pansexual and it's just nice to see queer people of color particularly black queer characters just living their authentic lives and their identity not being the focus of the story like struggles of their identity that cross-section of being a person of color black and being queer and that being like a struggle story it literally was just them trying to live their best lives and it's incidental so the queer representation is not something that is forced there are queer characters that are on earth and these alien planets is just kind of a universal thing and I know that Dow is known for doing this in The Sound of Stars but it was my first time reading her and it was nice to see that within the context of this story. So overall it was an okay story. It was a slight disappointment because I had such high hopes for it but it didn't deliver the way that I wanted it to deliver. So like I said I only ended up giving this one 3.5 stars. So my first five star read of the year which I'm so happy and excited for was Violetta by Isabella Allende and this is a translated work and it was my first book by this author and I enjoyed it it made me cry like a baby beautiful book definitely check it out I think by the time that this video goes up it's not released just yet I don't think it comes out to the 25th but oh, it was so good golden I absolutely loved it so Violetta is of course about the character of the same name and it starts with her birth and at 1920s just as we are in the midst of the flu epidemic and it takes place in South America and her family does pretty well during the epidemic however when the Great Depression hits that's when things go south for her family and she ends up going through a lot of loss and change and then we literally follow the course of her life from that point on for a hundred years. So each part of this book is actually written in letter format and Violetta is writing this story to someone and I'm not going to tell you who it is because it does spoil the story but I absolutely appreciated just the quiet but beautiful writing that occurred when we're hearing from this character's voice and it really made me feel like she was writing the letters to me and like I said it takes place over the course of a hundred years but there's a certain precision and clarity that's on each page that you just have to respect as a reader because it's just so excellent it's so good and I really appreciate that so in the course of this hundred years Allende gives us a lot about Violetta in terms of like her the loves of her life like the men that she 
meets the people in her community the people who are part of her family the children that she ends up having but what I do love is that Ayende made sure that she did cover some of the major historical and political events that did take place within the hundred years that we're following this character's life and that includes like I said the flu epidemic we are following the Great Depression the Cuban Revolution the women's suffrage movement um, the Chilean dictatorships it's so much history in it and as a history nerd I think I really really appreciated all of that information I think the beauty of this novel is that everything comes full circle so we start with her birth during the flu epidemic and as we get to the end of the novel we realize that it is 2020 and she is writing from the COVID pandemic and I keep saying flu epidemic and I mean flu pandemic <laughs> but we are you know we are getting the perspective of her from the COVID pandemic and to see everything come full circle is just it's it's a beautiful thing but it's also a heartbreaking thing and you know I think that we get to see Violetta grow as a character she was a child who had everything a silver spoon to having nothing to having to really build things up for herself we see her triumphs and her downfalls we see her fall in love we see her get her heart broken and we see this woman that just does nothing whether it is a simple task or whether it is a relationship she does nothing without passion and she is a woman that decided to decided to live life on her own terms regardless of whatever expectations people may have had of her and I so connected to that just a powerful beautiful character and I cannot wait to read more by end day I think that her writing style is just something that I'm really really going to appreciate in the future. So after that I did end up reading some comics. I'm not going to talk about these comics because I did a full reading vlog with these comics and that is the video that would have gone up before this one. So for that video I read Archie Volume 1 by Mark Wade. I read Unearth a Jessica Cruz story by Lillian Rivera. I read Ianu Child of Wonder by Roy Okupe. I'm hoping I'm saying his name right. I read Thirsty Mermaids by Kat Lee. I read, I read The Awakening Storm, a graphic novel, which is City of Dragons, number one, by Jamal Yogis. I read Making Friends by Kristen Gudsna. I read Peace by Peace, the story of Nisrin's Hishab. And then I also read The Stone Keeper, which is Amulet book number one. So if you want to know more about those books that I read because they were part of that graphic novel comic reading vlog that I ended up doing, I will leave that video linked in the card symbol above for you all to check out. I actually forgot one of the books that I read for that vlog. I didn't include it in this The Beauty Volume 1 by Jeremy Hahn. My bad y'all. Okay, so the next book that I read in between reading all those comics was The Charm Offensive by Alison Cochran. And I know a lot of people have enjoyed this book. It was one that had been on my radar for quite some time. And I did love some elements of it. I love that it was kind of like that talk show setup and that there was great mental health representation. But there was a specific element of the book that I did not enjoy. And yeah, I don't know if a lot of people noticed this as being an element of of the book. So the Charm Offensive is a contemporary romance novel that focuses on two characters by the name of Charlie and Dev and Dev is a producer on the show and Charlie is the next contestant and basically he is supposed to be on there trying to find love. Clearly Charlie is just not going to do this. He has issues finding a companionship he's struggling a lot he doesn't even believe in the concept of the reality show but dev and charlie end up spending a lot of time together because dev is kind of like his handler and he wants to help him find the best match that works for his personality his expectations his needs and in doing so the two end up finding that they have a connection with each other there are a lot of different elements at play here charlie and dev both struggle with mental health issues and both of them have trouble confronting those issues because they are afraid of how the world will perceive them and they are afraid of whether the world will truly like understand the mental health illnesses that they are struggling with and it's clear that the two of them become very open with each other and that they really trust each other and they see each other as safe spaces because they're able to really acknowledge what they're struggling with with one another. I think what I did like about 
about what Cochrane did with this book is that she has the two of them really falling in love here and Dev is openly gay but Charlie is not really sure what his sexual identity is and what she does with Charlie is she really discusses the wide spectrum of asexuality and their comments about people who are asexual are all sex repulsed and that's quickly you know corrected and she definitely explores like what it can mean to be asexual and by putting these two characters together she really breaks the the mold of what it means to have a heteronormative relationship on a reality tv show i think that this is very indicative of like shows like the bachelor and the bachelorette like the format is and we often see that in situations where all of these people who are on these matchmaking love type of reality shows they're heterosexual cisgendered individuals and it leaves out an entire spectrum of people who are deserving of love and you know deserving of the opportunity maybe to find love in a reality tv show type of way so i'm glad that she did kind of break that down and really did address the the basics of what a reality show does end up doing wrong when it comes to choosing people and their experiences. I think that Cochran definitely has strong writing skills and the reader is instantaneously pulled into the book. I thought that this was going to be your typical run of the mill, you know, like reality TV show type of thing. And it ended up being so much more than that. And I really, really appreciated that because I wasn't expecting that. So there is a strong gift there for, for writing ability. I think the pacing went really, really well. And like I said, like I flew through this book, I finished this book in a day and that's because it was just so easy to digest. With that being said, out of all the wonderful things that I did enjoy about this book, one of the biggest hiccups that I did have is with Dev. Dev is identified as Indian American and quite honestly, you would never know that Dev was Indian American past the point of Cochran saying that he is Indian American. There are no defining attributes, no qualities, no nothing. He literally could have been any race or ethnicity at that point. And the reason why I have issue with that is because when authors don't really delve into maybe the cultural experiences of a character that they're putting into their book that is from the BIPOC community. What they're doing is they are including diversity for the sake of diversity to say that it exists in that book and unfortunately that can be extremely offensive to people from the community and I had a problem with that being done in the book One to Watch which I did not like that book at all which was another reality TV type of book but there was a lot more issues with that book but that author did the same thing where it felt check boxy like I'm going to include this person and say that they are this race and or ethnicity because it will show that I have diversity in my book for that you could just make all your characters white like there's no point in that because Dev read like any other character. Dev could have been white and they were only, the only time that I really remember that Dev was Indian American was when his parents came into the picture and I was like oh yeah he is Indian American but other than that like I wouldn't have known that. I would have completely forgotten that he was and it's not saying that it has to be trauma induced or we have to include like a struggle story but if you're going to include that like make some cultural references, do some exploration, do some research, do some studying that gives that identity some depth. Like not just we're just painting over and creating this identity because we want to have this checkbox of diversity. So that was really, really disappointing to me. I think I definitely would have rated this book higher had it not been for that. But because of that, I only ended up giving it 3.5 stars. The next book that I ended up reading was A Girl on the Lake by India Hill Brown. And I decided to pick this one up. I still haven't read read her first book, The Forgotten Girl, which I've heard ex excellent things about, but I decided to pick this one out because it came out this month and I had an early review copy of it. So this is about a young girl by the name of Celeste and her and her brother and her cousins are spending about two weeks I believe at their grandparents lake house and when well prior to Celeste getting there she's taking these swimming lessons and the guy who's the instructor is awful it's an awful man like he's not nice at all and she doesn't end up learning to swim but she was supposed to before she got to the lake but when they get there they you know talk to their grandparents and they learn a little bit about their family history and one of the strongest things about this book was the historical context in which we're learning about like the most basic things that black people couldn't do like go to a swimming pool 
people because they were segregated or when people would drain an entire pool because a black person stuck their foot in it because the water was then considered contaminated. So knowing that things like that happen, like your most basic things black people did not have the ability to do, it's kind of rough, but it provides great context for the story. And it was in a situation where her grandmother's sister, which would be their aunt, was not able to get swimming lessons so she ends up drowning and then things kind of like go haywire because we see some strange things begin to happen and then all the kids start blaming each other because they're like why are you trying to you know scare me or tease me or whatever or play pranks on me and everybody's like I'm not doing it I'm not doing it we find out that Celeste's aunt actually is identical to her they look just alike so there's some weird things that begin happening and I thought that that was really fun especially because the grandparents were convincing them that the house wasn't haunted so it makes the stakes of the book even higher unfortunately this book i think is painted as like a middle grade horror book you know maybe late children's early middle grade horror book and it's not scary at all i'm not saying that because i'm an adult but i don't even think that middle grade audiences will find this book scary so it might be kind of disappointing for people who pick up this book expecting it to be horror like horror and scary and i heard that the forgotten girl was really really creepy and they don't get the same vibe that they may have gotten in that book so it may end up being a disappointment but overall it was a solid story and I will be picking up The Forgotten Girl maybe this month or probably next month but I did end up giving this one 3.5 stars. So the next thing that I ended up reading was actually historical romance which if you know anything about me I mainly stay away from historical romances because it's a lot of them I don't know where to start and I'm always nervous about whether I'm really going to like them or not but I decided to pick out or pick up Secrets of a Summer Night by Lisa Claypez because I've heard so much about Lisa Claypez and I thought that this would be one that I would end up really enjoying and actually I did end up enjoying it so this is about a woman by the name of Annabelle who is of course looking for a husband she's a wallflower and she's not having the best luck she ends up going to this ball and she connects with three other women who are also wallflowers and they kind of make this pact amongst each other that they are going to help each other find husbands and Annabelle definitely struggles the only person that she's catching the attention of is a character by the name of Simon and Simon is like I'll give you the pleasure of your life but I'm not finna marry you and so it was really really fun one to see the relationship develop between Annabelle and these other three women it was a solid friendship they really really liked each other and respected each other and then it was fun watching the banter between Annabelle and Simon Simon is definitely like swoon worthy I really really enjoyed him he made me laugh like I was laughing out loud as I read this book which is always a good sign of great writing. I think that I had trouble connecting with Annabelle because she does come off as kind of stuck up in some parts of the book. I mean I'm empathetic to why she was like that but sometimes it makes it hard to connect with her. I also found that in reading this I am a fan of historical romances that have an HEA but we explore their relationship after the HEA. So Simon of course and Annabelle end up connecting but we get to see their relationship grow even further after they finally make that point of connection with each other and I really did enjoy it. I think it just made me super excited to see what Clay Pez has done with the rest of the series especially because the other three girls I found to be very funny and interesting and I can't wait to dive into their books probably the rest of the, I really want to finish the series this year so hopefully I can. I ended up giving this one four out of five stars. The next book that I ended up reading was The Echo Wife by Sarah Gailey which was one that I didn't know how it's going to feel because this one has such polarizing views on it and it is a science fiction book and I think a lot of people were expecting more so like a fast-paced thriller and it definitely is not that and there's it's difficult to talk about this book because you don't want to end up spoiling it because it is easy to spoil but it focuses on a woman by the name of Eveline and Eveline is the narrator of the book and we find out that Eveline's husband has been having an affair. What is weird about this affair is that he decided that he was going to clone Evelyn and create a more docile and, and very compliant version of her. So he's cheating on her with her, which in itself is weird, which is where the sci-fi elements come in. It's a lot of discussion about cloning. But you know, what was weird about it was that I expected to go into this book like, oh, I definitely feel for Evelyn. Like, I mean, her husband cloned her, cheated on her, and then, you know, decided that they no longer were going to be in a relationship like I'm going to feel so much anger for her and I was not 
I was not angry the way I thought I was going to be angry because this very much so was a character analysis. We see everything from Evelyn's eyes and there's a lot of flashbacks to the relationship that Evelyn had with both her mother and her father and Nathan and we get to see how those relationships have shaped her into the person that she is. It's very much so a a kind of analysis on cyclical abuse and how much influence parents have when they are raising their, cha um, their children and the impact that they have on raising their children. We continue to see the evolution of Evelyn and there are some calculated aspects of her, especially when we see how she deals with Martine and how she is surprised that she has feelings for this, this thing that is not even really truly a human being. And what ends up happening is, is very interesting Thing. and people are like oh well it doesn't have a big bang like type of ending like a thriller because it's not supposed to it's it's the story within the details when you get to the end it's the details that matter and the commentary about those details really really shines through if you pay attention to the actions of everyone in the ending of the book and that's all i'm gonna say but i did end up enjoying this one more than i thought and it was not what i expected and i'm glad i didn't go in thinking like this is going to be this huge thriller or whatever the case may be because i think i would have been disappointed but because i didn't go in thinking that i really did like it and i ended up giving this one four out of five stars so the next thing that i ended up reading was portrayal the final act of the trump show by Jonathan Carl and Jonathan Carl is a Washington ABC correspondent and I know a lot of people ask me like well why do you keep reading these books about Trump and I have a reason for that there's a video coming out about that so I'm not going to say too much about this book because I'm going to cover it in greater detail later on but I did end up giving this one four stars it is not explicitly a whole lot of new information especially if you follow certain things about the trump administration however i feel like every book that i read brings a different perspective of their experience with the trump administration and i learned some pretty interesting and unique things about the trump administration through this book including like why trump really didn't attend the inauguration how he was really feeling about covid and some of the weird things that happened once he was diagnosed with covid so i did End up getting tidbits of new information but I'm going like I said I'm going to discuss this one in more detail at a later date so just hold off I know this is like the first time where I haven't really like done a full-blown review but I promise you a review is coming but I did end up giving this one four out of five stars the next one that I ended up reading was the wall of Winnipeg and me by Mariana Zapata I ended up reading this one because Brie gave this to me as a recommendation because I was looking for a brief from in love and words I was looking for a recommendation of slow burn romances because of the fact that I love birthday girl and birthday girl is a slow burn romance but let me tell you something Mariana Zapata is the queen of slow slow burn romances this book is over 600 pages it is about Vanessa and Aiden Vanessa serves as Aiden's assistant his personal assistant Aiden plays in the NFL and he is one of the best I think he's a defensive lineman I think that's his position but he is one of the best and he is just not very kind to her all the time and it comes to a point where Vanessa's like screw you I'm leaving I want to pursue other things in my life you don't really care about me anyway but then Aiden comes back and he's like I need you to do something for me because it's going to help save my career and at first she's like no I'm not doing it and then she agrees to do it I think what's so amazing about this because I've read books all levels of heat I've read books where characters like literally are in bed the first 15 pages and then books where it takes the characters forever to get to that scene where they're together this literally does not happen until like the very last moment of the book and I appreciated it because of the fact that it built a realistic relationship we get to spend so much time getting to know Vanessa and Aiden and they really get to spend so much time getting to know each other they literally become best friends and it makes the relationship so realistic because there's a solid foundation that is believable that they're relationship does end up working out when we get to that epilogue because it's like they spent so much time just getting to know each other and then by the time you get to the point in which they recognize how much they do love and care for each other you're literally aching for it you're like oh I'm just yes 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 they're finally they're finally there they're finally there and you really appreciate it and it speaks very well to you know Mariana Zapata's ability as a writer because this is 600 pages it's not 600 pages of filler it's 600 pages of detailed and exquisite character exploration and character development and I appreciated it. It was beautifully done. I love 
so many aspects of this book. I even love the relationship that Vanessa had with Zach, who is a side character and he is a teammate of Aiden and they just had a great support system and it was great because Vanessa goes through a lot in her personal life and details with like her, her parents and her siblings and friendships and stuff. So it was nice to see her have this solid friend that she could confide in and it wasn't a one-way street. They really depended upon each other. They worked great together as a team of friends and it was just nice seeing that this was just such a beautiful romance book I loved it the only reason why I didn't give it five stars is that I think it would have been just like chef's kiss top grade romance if we would have gotten Aiden's perspective this is a single POV we only see it from Vanessa's perspective and a lot of times it kind of it kind of, it didn't, I don't say it frustrated me, but I really, really wanted to see things through Aiden's lens and I never really got that. So, oh man, I wish it was a dual POV, but it wasn't. But 4.5 stars, I already have my next Mariana Zapata book queued up, ready to read it. I think this one's like 500 pages, whatever. I'm, I'm probably gonna fly through it. The next book that I ended up reading was a really, really quick read. It was a kind of a, I'd say more so children's book, more than a middle grade book, but I think it kind of borders the fence and it's when winter robinson came by uh brenda woods and it is set against the backdrop of the watts riots it takes place in la in the 1960s it focuses on a main character by the name of eden and she's really really into music and her cousin winter comes and they are kind of like spending time exploring the city and stuff and he's really interested in the difference between living in you know out in the west as opposed to the south because Eden and her family move from the south to Los Angeles and he has these assumptions that like oh you know it's so different out here you don't have to sit in the back of the bus and he's quickly reminded that even though you know it's not as obvious there's still racism alive and well which I think is good for kids to see because a lot of times especially when I was in school like kids were taught like the north was good moving out west, west was good the south was evil and it's like no there was racism all over the country it was just more subtle in some places than others and i'm glad that that was acknowledged of course we do get some inspiration of like the watts riots and it's not done in an explicitly graphic way it's toned down a bit but the historical knowledge is still there and the author actually uh, was alive during the time of the watts riots what i did really really love about this book is that it showed black kids just doing normal things black families in General. There's a lot of details about like kids in the neighborhood playing, hanging out, listening to music, what they were eating for dinner, like what you know clothes they were wearing to church. It was just everyday things and I know that that's super important because there's been a lot of conversations about balancing you know black joy and black trauma and this one is an example of handling that balance very very well. The one thing that I wish that this book did a little bit more of is that Eden is very very into music that's kind of stated within the first pages of the novel but it's only explored in the beginning and the end and I wish that it was actually carried all throughout the book instead but I do need to check out more books by Brenda Woods I enjoyed this one I ended up giving it four out of five stars the next two books that I ended up reading were Saga volume seven and eight which I'm not going to really talk about because by the time this goes up we would have already done our live show for Saga so I'll make sure I link that discussion up in the card symbol above absolutely love this comic book series y'all it's so good it's so 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 good I absolutely love it it's it's phenomenal the next book that I ended up reading was was Thrive, which is a part of the Callaway Sisters and Addicted series. It's a cross of two series that focus on this entire family of people who are in relationships. And this is technically Addicted book number four. And I ended up giving this one 3.5 stars. I've already read this one. I'm doing a reread, read, trying to finally finish this series because I need to finish it. It's been years. The last time I read this book was in 2017. And I'm like, just finish the series already like just please finish the series so I am working my way through rereading it and I decided to revisit this one I still ended up giving it 3.5 stars there really isn't much that I absolutely love about this installment in the series we're getting everything from Hot House Flower and Kiss the Sky that's what it is we're getting everything from those two books except now it's from Lily and Lowe's perspective so it just really feels like it's a rehashing of things that we already know I think that there were some good points in which we really get to see Lily and Lowe support each other through their 
your addiction issues. If you've never heard of the Addicted series before, it is about Lily and Lo. It is more of a new adult type of romance and these two both have addictions. Lily is addicted to sex, Lo is addicted to alcohol and it is about their romance and then we get to see romance of Lily's two sisters and some other characters which I can't go into because it's kind of spoilers but like I said this one really felt like a filler book I think this is kind of a book for like hardcore fans who are really really into the addicted series and just love like love 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 Lily and Lo I do like Lily and Lo but I think my favorite couple is probably Rike and Daisy I like them a whole lot but I yeah so yeah I yeah it, it's not bad and it's not a bad book it's standard you know solid read but you don't really learn anything new so there really isn't much to say about that one the next book and the last book that I read in my 30 book read first half of January is Pizza My Heart which is part of a the wish series wish books are books that are produced by Scholastic that are targeted at tweens so between the ages of 8 to 12 because that is a demographic that's usually left out of of publishing like they're not really thought about because it usually jumps from like automatically with middle grade to, you, to a young adult and Scholastic has created this line to help transition kids into young adult and a lot of them focus on like friendships and family and a lot of times too like first crushes or first loves so this one is the latest one I had an advanced readers copy of this one and this one is by Rhiannon Richardson so basically this book follows Maya and her family as they move from Brooklyn to a small town in Pennsylvania because her parents are opening up the second restaurant in this pizzeria that they have called Soul Slice and it is a cross section between like pizza and soul food which I think is really cool. Clearly, clearly Maya is hesitant about having to go to a new school and make new friends and definitely is struggling with the idea of leaving everything behind. This is a book that I would have loved to have when I was in middle school especially when you end up having to make so many transitions. Middle school is just hard within itself but having to make transitions at that age is particularly hard. I am so sorry if you hear the dog barking. I like it's just we're almost there y'all we are almost there I promise you we're almost there but um, it just reminded me of things that I experienced when I was in middle school. I think that Richardson did a good job of balancing the old with the new. So Maya still does keep in touch with one of her best friends um, from back home and she does make new friends and I love too that Maya finds herself absorbed within art and Richardson doesn't just use this as like kind of a thing to state. She explores different art forms and she talks about it on page which means that she really did some research into what it means to be an artist and use that as a way for Maya to kind of have her moment to be able to process what she's going through. And I really appreciate it. It was just a cute novel. It was quick to read. I definitely want to check out some more of the wish books. I ended up giving this one four out of five stars. All right y'all so that is it. Those are the 30 books. <laughs> Those are the 30 books that I read so far in January. Oh my gosh, this, probably, this video is probably going to be stupid long. But anyway, um, what I'm currently reading, I'm currently reading a couple of things. I'm, I'm looking down at my phone right now trying to figure out exactly what I'm reading. I am listening to the audiobook of Daughter of the Moon Goddess, which is the first book in the Celestial Kingdom duology by Sulin Tan. And this one is good. It's a slow burner and I'm enjoying it because Ashley is deciding to read a more fantasy this year this one is kind of in between YA and adult I see it marketed as YA but then a lot of companies like vendors are selling it as an adult book so that'll be an interesting discussion I also started the super villains guide to being a fat kid which is one that I'm trying to finish because that one comes out next week and then I have some manga that I'm trying to get through too which is actually behind me which y'all can't see but I have all this manga that I need to finish and then I also am going to be starting Persepolis soon because it is the comic book club pick of the month so we are going to be reading that and having the live show discussion I believe on the 26th the, the actual video or the date and schedule and stuff is already on my channel so be sure to check that out let me know in the comments below what you've read so far in January there's no possible way that I could have done this at the end of the month this video would have been like two hours long <laughs> So I'm glad that I'm spitting it, spitting it out. I'm glad that I'm putting it out early and we'll cover the second half at the end of the month. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more content, really click subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And I'll be back with a, another video soon.